All right, ladies and gentlemen, our class recording for today has begun. So, let's start off reviewing briefly what we talked about yesterday. Today, this unit, we start talking about chemical bonding. And we discussed the idea that if you look at the periodic table, depending on which periodic table you look at, there are somewhere between 110 to 120 elements listed depending on when it was published and blah, 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 you know, so anyway. But if you look just around this room, you probably could identify, sorry, backing up a little bit, right? We learned back in unit three, when we talked about Dalton's atomic theory and stuff like that, that elements are all unique from each other, right? Each element has its own set of properties that's different than the set of properties for every other element. But if you look around this room, you could probably identify more than 120 unique things. Meaning that those 120 unique elements cannot be the only things that it make up stuff in the universe. So there has to be a way for those 120 elements to come together to form other unique combinations. And that's what we get into when we talk about chemical bonding. So, first, by definition, chemical bond is an attractive force that holds atoms together. But, and we'll talk more about this as we get into this unit, the formation of chemical bonds involves energy much like many of the other things that we discuss in this class. But we said that from an energy standpoint, generally what are we trying to do with potential energy? Do we remember from yesterday? Well, let's go here, right? So I lift a tennis ball up in the air. Does it have potential energy? Yes, specifically what kind? Gravitational. If I let the ball go, what will happen to it? It will fall, but it falls from an energy standpoint because what's happening to the potential energy as it falls? It decreases. Naturally, processes will occur that result in lower potential energy. We generally see that in nature, right? This tennis ball falls because it has less potential energy at this position down on the table than it does up here in the air. Will it spontaneously start moving upward on its own? That never happens, right? But if we talk about it from an energy standpoint, if this ball is on the table and it starts moving upward, what happens to its potential energy? It what? It increases. Things don't happen that increase the potential energy of something. That doesn't happen naturally. Okay? Now, could we make it happen? Sure. But we got to get energy from some other place. It doesn't happen naturally. Now, another thing that we talked about, sorry, to build on that, okay? While this ball deals with gravitational potential energy, atoms have something that we call chemical potential energy. And just like other kinds of potential energy, bonds will form between atoms if they have less or lower potential energy than when they are separated, right? And I think I kind of mentioned that yesterday. On the screen, it just says lower energy, but specifically we're talking about lower potential energy. And even more specifically, we're talking about lower chemical potential energy. But just like when this ball falls, right, its potential energy decreases, but what happens in response? Kinetic energy increases because of what? Conservation, right? Even though one form of energy may be decreasing, the overall energy has to remain the same. And the same thing is true of bond formation. And that's why bond formation is generally an exothermic process. Okay? So, did we get this far yesterday or is this where we like left off? Okay. So, 
Are we familiar with the term egg, with the term exothermic? Well, because we know English, let's try and figure it out, right? Okay. If we refer to something as exo, what is that meaning? Out or outside, right? And thermic is probably mentioning something about what? Heat, right? So if we refer to something as exothermic, it is giving off heat or releasing heat, or we could say more generally, it is releasing energy. It doesn't always have to be heat. It could be light or something else. But when bonds form between atoms, generally energy is released. Because of conservation. We said that bonds will form because the atoms have less energy together than they did separately. Well, if their energies went down individually, you can't just get rid of that energy, right? It doesn't just disappear. So basically, it just is given off as heat, right? So usually, when atoms form bonds with each other, it feels warm or it looks hot or it feels hot because energy is just giving being given off all right and we'll see examples of that as we move along okay good there okay so last bonding deals with valence electrons there's a blast from the past everybody right yeah okay so Valence electrons, like it says up on the board, are electrons where in an atom? Highest energy level. And that basically means where are they in the atom? On the outside, right? On the edge of that atom, wherever it might be for that specific atom. So, if we're going to talk about bonding, we really need to have a way... To keep track of these valence electrons. So let's talk about that. We do, the, we do that, keep track of valence electrons, with something called a Lewis structure. Okay? It's named after a guy, Lewis. Okay? Um, he, didn't invent the, yeah, he didn't invent valence electrons or anything like that, but you know, it was named after him. Okay? So, by definition, a, a Lewis structure is a symbolic representation of elements that shows the valence electrons. And we draw them by drawing the elemental symbol and the valence electrons are then represented by dots. Okay? All right. Got that down? Okay. If you don't have your periodic table, pull it out because we're going to use it a lot here over the next couple minutes. Okay, so let's go here and let's go here. Okay, so up on the board is a periodic table. Okay, looks a little might look a little different from the one that you guys have, but it's all there, right? So here's what I'm going to do now because I'm recording, I took a screenshot of this and put it into here so if you're watching the class recording you can still see it while i'm writing it might be kind of hard, small for you guys to see that's why you need to have your periodic table out okay all right so we are going to start today right underneath where you guys wrote down the definition of a lewis structure i named five elements okay ultimately we're going to draw the lewis structures for those five elements but some more along the way so the first one that shows up right is lithium is that correct okay if this actually works sometime maybe we'll draw it so stand by everybody there we go okay all right so First element that we gotta draw a Lewis structure for is lithium. I'm gonna write something up on the board first. You don't necessarily have to write this, but we're gonna use it sort of as a step-by-step -step getting to where we need to get to. Okay? 
Yeah? Ooh. Ouch. <laughs> right? So first, does it at least look familiar? Yes. All right, that's a what? An electron configuration, right? So how many electrons does lithium have total? Three, because that's lithium's atomic number, right? And if we count up the electrons in the electron configuration, two here, one here, total of three. How many valence electrons does lithium have? One, right? Remember, valence electrons are the only are only the ones that show up in the highest energy level, right? Here, two is the highest energy level. There's only one electron here. So that means lithium has one valence electron. And that means if we're going to draw the Lewis structure for lithium, like we saw on this slide, right? Uh-oh, didn't want to do that. Like we saw on, oh, goodness gracious. This slide, Lewis structures, have the elemental symbol and valence electrons represented by dots. So we're going to go here and draw the elemental symbol, Li, and then one dot to represent that one valence electron. Okay. Now, does it matter where you draw the dots? Not exactly. But you'll find that when I'm drawing them, for metals, I usually draw the dots on the right, and for non-metals, I draw them on the, the also the right, but on the other side, and you'll see why in a little bit. Although really, it doesn't matter, and we'll talk about why it doesn't matter in a little while. Okay. All right. Are we okay with that process for now? Okay. All right. Next thing I'm going to do does not show up on your outline, but it's meant to prove a point. Okay. All right, there's another electron configuration. What is that the electron configuration for? Okay. Greg says sodium, right? Greg, how do you know this is electron configuration for sodium? Has 11 electrons, right? 2, 4, 10, 11. Okay? So that's the electron configuration for sodium. How many valence electrons does sodium have? One, right? Valence electrons, only electrons in the highest energy level, right? The third energy level is the highest energy level here, one valence electron. Meaning, if we are going to draw the Lewis structure for sodium, right, we first draw the elemental symbol and then the number of valence electrons. How many valence electrons does sodium have? One. Lewis structure for lithium and Lewis structure for sodium look a lot alike, right? Because where are they on the periodic table? They're in the same family or the same group, right? Specifically, which family or which group? Do we remember its name? The alkali, nope, alkali metals, right? So, kind of led you guys down the wrong path on that one, so, okay? So these are alkali metals. Without drawing the electron configuration, what would the Lewis structure for potassium look like? There it is, right? They're all going to look the same because they all have the same number of valence electrons. Good? Again. Not something on your chart, not something on your outline, sorry. Not something on your outline, but there's an electron configuration. What is the electron configuration for? Okay. That is the electron configuration for calcium. For two reasons, okay? Actually, let me do this. Hopefully this works. Come on, everybody. Yeah, there we go. Okay. All right. So, 
That's the electron for cal configuration for calcium. There's two ways we can figure that out. One, how many total electrons does it have? 20. The other way that we can figure it out is if we look, well, it's first, how many valence electrons does calcium have? Two, because, because, there we are, right? Highest energy level is the fourth energy level. There are two electrons in it, so two valence electrons. And that means that the Lewis structure for calcium would look like this. Okay? Regardless of where you drew the two dots, it needs to have two dots. Good with that? Okay? The other way we could do this is if we look at the electron configuration 4s2, right? 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2. Look at that. Oh, man. Okay? There's a reason why the periodic table is shaped this way. It wasn't just randomly chosen to be this weird shape, okay? Are we okay with that for now? Okay. This pattern holds as long as we're talking about either the blue squares or the yellow squares. Right now, we are gonna disregard this part of the periodic table and this part of the periodic table, at least in terms of this discussion for Lewis structures. Okay? The next one that shows up on your outline, if I am not mistaken, is oxygen. Is that correct? Okay? So, there's the electron configuration for oxygen. How many valence electrons does oxygen have? Oxygen has six valence electrons. Okay? When we are talking about valence electrons, it is not just the last part of the electron configuration. It is the highest energy level. What's the highest number that shows up in that electron configuration? Two. Remember when we were drawing that big picture that had all the different layers on it and we kept putting on down, right, different shapes? Remember, anything that had a two in front of it was always what? Regardless of what shape it was, if it had a two in front of it, it was the same what? same color. I don't remember what color it was, but it was the same color, right? Remember, anything in this energy level, regardless of whether it's an S or a P, is still a valence electron. So, oxygen has six valence electrons. Two here, four here. Okay? And that means if we're drawing a Lewis structure, first we're gonna draw the elemental symbol, and then you don't have to draw it this way, but there's a reason why I'm drawing it this way that maybe will make sense a little bit later after a couple of days, okay? So, I'm gonna draw it this way. One, two, three, four, okay? Remember we talked about when we were doing orbital diagrams, Hund's rule, what do electrons try to do as much as they can? Try to spread out, right? And they won't pair up until they have to. So these are the first four valence electrons in oxygen. Then we can start pairing them up, right? So there is our Lewis structure for oxygen, okay? How many valence electrons? Six. Let me do this. Again, not on your sheet, but... Okay? There's another electron configuration. 
That's the electron configuration for what? It's the electron configuration for sulfur. Okay? It has 14? Wait. 16. I knew it was 16. Why did I say 14? It has 16 total electrons, but how many valence electrons does it have? Six valence electrons. And that means if we're drawing a Lewis structure, right? It would look like this. Again, where are sulfur and oxygen on the periodic table? Same family, same valence electrons, same Lewis structures. Good there? Okay. The next one on your sheet, I believe, is fluorine. Is that correct? So following the pattern, how many valence electrons is fluorine going to have? Seven. If we write an electron configuration for fluorine, it looks like this. That's seven valence electrons, right? And that means the Lewis structure for fluorine would look like this, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Does that make sense? Without going through the whole big process, the next one on your outline is chlorine, yes? Where is chlorine in relation to fluorine on the periodic table? Same family. So what's the Lewis structure for chlorine going to look like? going to look exactly like fluorine, except chlorine in the middle. Good there? Okay. The next one on your outline, I believe, is neon. Is that correct? Okay. So, following the pattern, how many valence electrons does neon have? Eight. And so if we're drawing a Lewis structure... It would look like this. Okay? Good there. One thing I want to point out before we move on, okay? So here's neon, right? Let me just cut it off, but there's neon, okay? The next element on the periodic table is what? Next element on the periodic table is what? It's good sodium, right? As we've already established, how many valence electrons does sodium have? Just one. So it appears that the maximum number of valence electrons that something can have is what? Eight. That's an important number. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Okay? Good? So far? Yeah. A lot of you guys, some of you, some of you may have done some of this before, right? Have, yeah, I know that's a little familiar. So, okay. Kate, go ahead. Okay, so Kate asked, and I know that this is something that, because I've talked to other people about it already, okay? Technically, we could draw the electron configuration for four, or sorry, not electron configuration. We could draw Okay. Right? That's fluorine. You tell me, what is this? We talked about this a little earlier in the year. This is what kind of a model? This is a Bohr model, right? Nice, right, for real? Yeah, all right? This is a Bohr model because what is it showing you about the electrons? They're on like steps, right? Defined rings, okay? Now, while this can get us where we're going to when we're talking about bonding, the electrons that we're really concerned with are only these electrons. This stuff really doesn't play any role in bonding. So a Lewis structure is like a simplified Bohr model only showing us valence electrons because that's really all the electrons we care about when we're talking about bonding. 
Okay? So it's just kind of a simplified model that only deals with the things that we really need to know for bonding as opposed to all of the electrons. Because if we have to draw a Bohr model for like calcium that has 20 electrons, it's pretty big. Right? So just simplify it. Okay? All right. Are we good with Lewis structures for now? Okay. Let's start taking that and applying it to what actually happens. Okay. So valence electrons are important because the number of valence electrons determines the chemical properties of an atom. And when we talk about chemical properties, we're basically talking about what other atoms does it bond with or does it not bond with. Chemical properties is a fancy way of saying it bonds with something or it doesn't bond with something. Atoms are trying to get to eight valence electrons. And they will take the shortest route to get there. We refer to this idea as the octet rule. Octet meaning eight, right? Now, for our purposes, different atoms can do different things to get to eight valence electrons. Sometimes they can gain electrons but other times they could lose electrons. And I know it, I spell it's, it, this, should, this shouldn't be losing, it should be losing, so, you know, only one O in losing. Sorry, everybody. So, what? Sorry. To illustrate that, we look at this sequence, okay? Starting off, if you look at the third row of the periodic table, period three, the first element in period three on the periodic table is what? Sodium. Sodium has one, how many valence electrons? One. Next one over from sodium is magnesium. How many valence electrons? Two. Then we skip the middle section because there's nothing in period three for the middle section, right? We get to aluminum, right? Three valence electrons. Silicon, four valence electrons. Phosphorus, five valence electrons. Sulfur, six valence electrons. Chlorine, seven valence electrons. Argon, eight valence electrons. But then, after argon, right, where do we head? All the way back to the other side to potassium. And potassium, because it's in the first column, only has how many valence electrons? One. Eight is the magic number. That's the octet rule. So, if we're talking about chlorine with seven valence electrons, what does it have to do to get to eight? Pick one up. But... If we're talking about potassium way on the other side, it only has one. Technically, it could pick up seven more to get to eight, but it's a lot easier if it goes backwards. And instead of gaining seven, if it loses one, now it's got eight and it's all good. Okay? Does that make sense? All right? So, oh, I don't know what happened right there. Okay, there we go. All right, it, atoms will either gain or lose electrons to have a full outer shell. Sometimes we'll refer to that as a valence shell. Metals will generally lose valence electrons, so their electron configuration becomes like the previous noble gas. Non-metals gain electrons to become like the next noble gas. We'll talk about noble gases here in a second. Phil, it's good. In the far right column.
column on the periodic table, right? Group 18, those are our noble gases. We just saw that noble gases have how many valence electrons already? Eight. They're already at the magic number, meaning they don't need to gain or lose to get there, right? That means, sorry, let me do this. That means that noble gases are unreactive. They don't form compounds with other elements, which we discussed when we were talking about the periodic table. That's one of the that's one of the uh, function or sorry, one of the properties of a noble gas. But now we can see from a structure standpoint. They don't form compounds with other elements because they don't need anybody's help, right? They're already perfectly content with their eight valence electrons. They don't need to gain anything. They don't need to give anything away. And as a result, they don't have anything to do with any other elements, right? Hence the name noble gases, right? If you're a nobleman, right? You don't have anything to do with anybody else. Why? Because you're better than everybody else, right? That's pretty much how it works, yes? Okay. That's kind of how they got the name, right? Sometimes we will refer to them as inert gases. Because when you are inert, you don't do anything, right? Just like inertia, yes? Inertia means what? You don't change, right? You just do whatever you're doing. Right? Inert gases don't do anything. Why? Because they already got the eight valence electrons. They don't have to do anything. Right? Now, more importantly, though, than just the number of valence electrons, remember, bonding is an energy process. Having eight valence electrons means that noble gases are already in a low energy state. As we discussed previously, this tennis ball, this tennis ball on the table, does it have gravitational potential energy? It's kind of a tricky question. Sorry, finish writing. All right, question. Does that tennis ball start moving upward on its own? No, right? Because we said it's in a low potential energy state right here. If it moves upward, what has to happen to its potential energy? It has to increase. Does that happen on its own? Noble gases are already in a low energy state. Will they gain or lose electrons? No, because that puts them in a higher energy state. Eight's the magic number. They're already at eight electrons. They don't want to move from that point. Okay? Does that make sense? Now, it's not necessarily the more valence electrons you have, the better or the less valence electrons you have, the better. It's how close are you to eight? That's the important part, okay? You gave me that face when I said that, and I was like, thought I had to, like, so, yeah, you did. You kind, of, you kind of made a weird face when I said that, so I just wanted to. All right, are we good with this for now? Okay, so, highest energy level of an atom is full, will not form any bonds. Is that a space, did you have to fill something in on that? So we need to get to the magic here in a second here. All right, are we ready for some magic? Yeah, magic's good, all right. So here we go, okay? Sorry, finish filling that out. And then we'll check out some magic, okay. Here we go. Come on, people, write it down so we can get to the magic. All right. 
So, here we go. All right. Sodium and chlorine actually form a compound by making a bond with each other, right? Do we know what they make when they form a bond with each other? They make sodium chloride, which makes your french fries taste delicious, right? Okay. All right, so let's talk about this. Here's our Lewis structure for sodium. How many valence electrons does sodium have? One, because it's in the first column. Here's our Lewis structure. You know why ketchup is so good? It's got a lot of salt in it. That's why it tastes so good, all right? So here's your Lewis structure for chlorine. How many valence electrons does chlorine have? How many, Lewis structures, or how many valence electrons does chlorine have? Seven. I heard a couple sixes out there. It's in column 17. It has seven valence electrons, all right? So as we just discussed, what's the magic number? Eight. So what's chlorine looking to do? Pick one up. What's sodium looking to do? Ditch this one, right? So, sodium has one valence electron. It is looking to lose it. That's letter B, number one. On your outline. But, chlorine has seven valence electrons. It's looking to gain one. That's letter C, number one. You have to kind of drop down a little bit on your outline, so. And so, as you guys have kind of made this conclusion, right? If sodium's looking to lose an electron and chlorine's looking to gain an electron, what's going to happen? This is going to happen, right? Ready? Right? right? Watch it. Watch it. Oh, man. I told you. I told you. Magic. All right? So. And if you would like to point out that now it's not exactly even, or rather, please do so. Okay? All right, so to wrap this up, right, for today, to wrap this up, back in chapter three, hold on, wait a second, you still have like three minutes left. Let me make this point, then you can get packed up. Okay? So, back in the third unit, when we talked about atomic structure, we always assumed what about the number of protons and the number of electrons in an atom? The same. But if we're starting to move electrons around, is that the case anymore? No. And that's what we're going to get into tomorrow with ions and then ionic bonding. No, see, not in 